Yeah, so, so <clears throat> today I'll be talking about uh, this problem and also how we then use uh, deep learning to aid our control design. So I'll just briefly give a short introduction of, on top of what Sylvia said. And I won't do, take, talk a lot, but, but essentially, yes, I did my PhD in 17 in um, Denmark. And actually, it was in control uh, applied in, 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 in the process, actually oil and gas. And later on, when I talk about where I come from, you will also realize how I have transitioned with the, with the, like the, the industry and the politics and so on. <clears throat> my research is in, in control um, and also in machine learning uh, for machine vision um, and fault detection and condition monitoring and application areas is robotics, but also in, in process control and, and water treatment. And I teach uh, modeling uh, and control uh, of robotic manipulators, um, uh, dynamic modeling. Um, I used to teach signal processing. Um, and I also teach a graduate course on condition monitoring. And as mentioned, uh, I, I lead the research group uh, offshore drones and robots. And of course, all this offshore, 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 you'll see why it's all offshore. And the last thing is Ogo University, Department of Energy. So a lot of our work is applied in some kind of energy. And you will hear me talk a lot about always relating things to energy. So just quick about our university uh, up here, you see the main campus in, in Olberg. I'll show you on a map. And this is our, our campus in, in Espia, which is the Danish pronunciation. Almost 20,000 students, almost 1,000 PhD students, um, 2,400 uh, academic staff, which are full-time, and yearly publication rate around almost 6,000, uh, and the financing of some number, I don't know, I'm not that uh, into the how much that me means and what that means to everything, but uh, some number. And also, we our, our university has different fields. So we have humanities, social sciences, medicine, and of course, where well, I'm part of the engineering science and IT and design. So I think it's similar to Cornell, many different uh, areas of research. Yeah. So just to put it in perspective, I don't have a map of the world where Denmark is because I know not everybody knows where Denmark is, but you know, you can check it. There's this little speck on top of Europe, just underneath Sweden and Norway, and a little bit to the to the east of, of England, but very small. So this is where I live. This is the main campus, and we have a campus in Copenhagen, which is the capital, which maybe you've heard about. Um, and you can see the location of our city, that it's kind of close to the, to the west coast. And our campus, as you can see, that uh, it's, it's a very relatively small campus, 400 students and roughly 80 staff. So I'll just quickly go through the city that I'm from and the history. I will not spend much time here, but I just want to give you an idea of what's going, how things are progressing. So essentially, after the war, after, after Denmark lost the war to German, uh, Prussia, but yeah, it's modern day Germany back in 1864. Uh, we lost a port, important port. So SPR was chosen to be a port. And one of the main things of, of this port was to export uh, goods to England. And one of the big things was like uh, butter, bacon, and all of those things that Denmark is now famous for in, in UK actually came from this port. And it was a rapid growth. It was actually referred to like the Denmark's Chicago rapid growth because of this uh, trade. But then it transitioned into fishing. You can see here. There was around 600 fishing boats. Um, and that's actually one of one of the things today. People still say, oh, SPI, that stinks. It stinks, it stinks because of the fishery. But there's actually no more fishery there. Because it, <clears throat> all the oil exploration has been done from SPI. So it has been the main oil uh, city of, of, of Denmark. So we transitioned from Chicago to, to Texas. And then um, around 2000, um, we peaked the oil production and then started going downwards. Also the politics changed around 2014 that oil and gas should be phased out because of many different aspects. But one main aspect was environment. Um, and that's also Denmark pioneered a lot of these wind turbine uh, ideas. And, and we also had the first large scale offshore wind turbine in 2002. 
And, and the reason I'm showing this history, not because I want to teach history, it's more to show the transition of how we have transitioned into more and more green energy. And that also reflects in my work and most of my colleagues. And today we have installed almost 80% of all the wind energy in Europe. And I, do, I couldn't find the quote, but I, I found it and I couldn't find it again. Every sixth wind turbine is actually going through the port of Espia into the world. So it's very important um, place. And that's why I have this picture. This is the city today. We still have some remnants of oil and gas, of course. We're still producing gas almost enough to supply the country. Not enough, of course, but we supply some part of it. And this is the new port, which now is old. We're building 1 million more square meters of port to support this ever-growing industry. Yes. So today, I will not be talking about wind industry, but I'll be talking about a new, uh, a, a new area that, that I'm exploring because of my, my passion for, for, for the environment. And <clears throat> essentially, the problem definition is wastewater. It's a global challenge, we know that, but it's also a very important resource that we can, through control and other methods, improve. And what I want to talk about today is, of course, I'll talk a little bit about the mechanisms. I'll talk a little bit about our early work and our results. But I also want to open up for, for people to think about this as, as a big challenge and also how people with background, especially here in CS, can actually do a lot of things here to, to help this, um, this problem. Um, <clears throat> so yes, I'll talk a little bit about the mechanisms, some of the challenges in the modeling and control. Um, and again, methods and, and results. So our focus is, of course, uh, modeling and control. And then we use deep learning to facilitate specifically the modeling and parts of the control. And the goal in the end is essentially the optimization of the system. So just so why are we doing it? Well, municipal wastewater is full of nutrients. We have phosphorus and nitrogen. And if we have a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen and we don't treat it, we let it out in the, into the ocean, we'll have eutrophication. And, and essentially to, to, to kind of go directly into the result, well, what we can have is, for example, we can have excess growth of, 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 of phytoplankton. Um, and in the worst case, they can consume the oxygen. And, and that's not really good in water because fish don't like that. But there are many other side effects as well. Uh, <clears throat> so what is our goal? Well, it's to reduce these nutrients uh, as much as possible before they are um, put into the, the, the waterways. Um, and not just to reduce them, but as I'll mention a little bit later, to reuse them. So, <clears throat> um, and another problem about this is, is of course, I have, I have this little picture that just came out like a couple of days ago while I was here, that we reached 8 billion people. And we're talking about large quantities. So that we have 34 billion gallons per day of wastewater in US. John, you probably know this better than me, but this is the number I could find. Um, these are large numbers. And that means when, when we have a large flow, we have to do you know, even small optimization uh, gains actually result in, in really large numbers. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'll talk a little shortly because it is also there's a there's a there's a logo of Fulbright up there because I'm a Fulbright scholar here. I'll also talk a little bit about the background in, 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 from my country's perspective and why they're investing in my research and, and research similar to mine. And, and it's essentially the government's focus has, is now uh, from 2020 that by 2030, the wastewater should be energy and most importantly, climate neutral. And the goals that the government has set there are three goals. I put the two ones that I have some that relate to me is reduction of nitrous oxide, which is part of, I'll briefly talk about it because it's a new project that we, we were awarded, but I don't have any published results I can talk about, is a reduction of, of nitrous oxide, which I'll explain also why that's important, and the reuse of phosphorus. Those are the two main things, which is the other work we work on. And just a few important facts, 80% of the wastewater is actually not clean globally. Electricity usage, which is an optimization parameter. 1.8 in Denmark, it's larger in EU and globally is even larger. 
And the reason it is 1.8 today is because of uh, efforts in control and optimization. Uh, <clears throat> and actually, we have a few plants that produce more energy than they use. Marcelispo is one of them. Uh, Billundan is one, another one, and there's a, a few more. And actually, this control, it's not because uh, I, it's my background and I'm trying to like promote it. This was identified in, uh, in, in the um, assessment of, of Denmark, which is like a, a water organization in Denmark that support research and also companies and wastewater treatment plants. So they have identified that improved control, we can improve this. <clears throat> and what I'm showing here is that uh, 2021 October natural gas usage uh, in the country in percentage, 25%, so a quarter of all the gas is actually from biogas. So we do import and use Russian gas as well, which we are phasing out, but we actually have a large amount of, of, of gas, biogas, and part of that actually comes from wastewater. And that's a very important factor. And this, uh, let me just go to the next, I have a comparison. This analysis <coughs> study was done for our um, EDA engineer training, that's like union of engineers uh, and Olberg University by, by some colleagues. Um, 2020, 2045, this is biogas and this is biogas in the future. So that means there's more and more focus on that we reuse as much as possible of the bio material we have. A lot of it comes from wastewater. And you can see 2045, there's no, no more oil and coal actually. Yes, so I think enough of politics. Um, I'll start talking a little bit about what is the system about? What is the control objective of, of some of the system we work on? And then I'll explain some of the methods. So <clears throat> wastewater treatment is mechanical, biological, and chemical. Uh, depending on which plant, it can be all of them or a subset. It is a large process interconnected system. So in, in control, we start talking about coupling in, in, the, in the system. Uh, and the discharge must be sufficiently clean not to stress the environment. So that might, means we, we have a trade-off. We have an optimization problem. We have quantity because we need to treat the amount that comes in, which is actually a disturbance for us. <clears throat> we need the quality and we are subjected to economy, but now also to nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, methane emissions and, 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 and many other things. And just a quick little overview of the system where we have raw sewage, mechanical uh, filtration, then we have biological filtration and some chemicals added to the system. So it's like a combination of many things to, to obtain, obtain the, the goal. Yes. <clears throat> yes, and then comes also the very interesting thing is that in Denmark, of course, these <coughs> facilities, they are government owned, but <clears throat> and, and in some countries they are not. And, and then also the economic perspective comes in, into play. And often wastewater is actually seen as a, as a, like a burden to the society, like you have to pay to do this and okay, how do we reduce this pay because we don't want to pay it. But actually there is an economic in incentive because we have actually systems that can recover materials. So generate energy and recover materials, which means we can actually earn money. And the example here, for example, with, from a local municipality uh, uh, treatment plant is they actually produce organic fertilizer that is then spread on the fields. Uh, phosphorus can be removed and used uh, to be sold as, as nutrients, bioplastics, Biogas is heat and energy, which is equal to money, all of it. So actually, it's not. It's sh there should be some rethinking about how we see wastewater. We should see it as a resource and not as a, as a waste, if you treat it properly. Okay. So what is our role, me and my my colleagues? Well, <clears throat> I mentioned it's a very complicated process, and and we're not the first ones who are doing this. I mean, this has been studied for a very long time. Um, and there are many state-of-the-art facilities which have planned wide control. Um, <clears throat> and, and in many cases, they have supervisory control with some low-level controllers, local controllers. Um, 
and that's of course a problem when we have this coupling issue and, and but there are even facilities that have it that use mpc maybe not for the entire plant but kind of it is getting improving so what is our goal well our goal is kind of to go from here to like fully automated everything uh, so we can optimize for the the aforementioned things on a plant-wide scale <clears throat> So what is the what is so our kind of plan here? Phase one, we have to understand the system because in order for us to do anything about it, we need to understand what all these processes are. Maybe not as much as uh, as, as uh, uh, like a biologist, but but we need to know essentially what is going on. Next thing is to improve the models. Uh, we have also been looking at <clears throat> first principles models, uh, looking at activated sludge models, and 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 and. Uh, many other things but then also using learning machine learning to to up, improve the models and then the last phase is, is control yes <clears throat> so today what i will continue to talk on is a little bit on the understanding system but mostly on the modeling so number one problem in modeling that everybody here mostly here people are from CS, data sets are the kind of one of the biggest issues, and this is often where we start, is how do we create a data set? So we look at the system. One of the things we do is decouple the subsystems and analyze them individually. We, uh, we look at what are the measured and unmeasured variables and outputs and disturbances. Um, and then kind of that's the first step. And, and then I have listed a few uh, challenges that 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 we have faced so far, and one of them is that the system is system is under underactuated. Um, there's a scarcity of measurements, and not just scarcity, as I'll show you later. Some of them are not uh, of good quality. Uh, there's a lot of indirect control. Um, sampling varies, and I have a few examples here. This is Danish names, and I don't know. It may be too small to read. read. There's a few Danish municipality uh, wastewater treatment plants, and you can just see an example here, sample interval. Valencia is five minutes, Scannabo is five minutes, and then Edelura is two minutes, and then uh, Fornes then is two minutes, and Kur is two minutes. So it also changes a lot. That means that certain dynamics we cannot capture simply because the data is not frequent enough. Yes. And there's another thing. I talked about M2O. For example, if you want to control M2O, these are the plants where we where we measure M2O. And I don't I think there's maybe a few more in the world, and that's it. And we have different amounts of sensors, but but we don't have these measurements everywhere. So so that's another thing. We can talk about all of these things, but we can't actually get the data from everywhere because it just simply doesn't exist yet. It probably will be more and more, but it's not there yet. And then a few other things like faulty sensors, poor calibration inaccuracies and sensor placement. And often when I when I talk about these systems in modeling the classes, I, I do the I, I try to give the the example to students uh, when they model that they have to think about these systems that are extremely uh, slow. So <clears throat> that's also why this is not that bad because some of the biological processes are relatively slow. But we do have certain dynamics uh, which which have uh, which are not that slow and they do impact impact some of the main variables yes so now we go into data uh, data um, data sets so the first thing of course data analysis figure out what are we looking at <clears throat> so <clears throat> here's the big question actually how to use operational data for modeling and control because we don't have a data set that is collected from a system that is made for this purpose we actually this data was there already. Nobody thought about us. They collected the data because the technicians and, and operators and so on, they needed data for, for other purposes. So that's also the reason why it's not always sampled in the right way and treated in the right way, because it was a different use for it. And I guess many of you working with, with data know as well that it's not always data is not always perfectly sorted, labeled, and so on. <clears throat> so first step is as you all know, which data to use. I have listed some of the, just, just a quick overview here to show you that there's different data. 
but then we, we, we write typical location. That's another problem that we have, that many of the systems are very different. So not just what kind of data, but where they are positioned, uh, are they positioned at all? Are they presented in the right place? Many cases they're positioned at the, at the effluent because of, of that's where they want to measure because that's essentially what they're checked for, but not inside of the process itself. And you have to imagine you're controlling a, a tank of, you know, enormous size with a lot of, uh, lot of liquid inside, uh, bacteria colonies that are maybe changing in different areas, different activities. And then you measure maybe one place in this huge vat. So you're kind of approximating what's in there and you're controlling, you know, something that you actually don't exactly know. So what is the procedure for identifying variables to include a data set? Well, it kind of goes in a circle. It's, at least that's what we've experienced now is that first we talk to the, uh, to the experts. In many cases, it's consultants and, and other engineers that, that help the, the, the treatment facilities and the operators. Then we perform data analysis. We I'll go forward and, and talk about it. And yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. So we perform different types of data analysis. Then we go back again and present it to them and say, okay, we have identified these parameters to be to be important. And then they probably say, yeah, that, that makes sense, but why this and so on and why not this? And, and that's how we slowly learn about the data. I'll go back to this figure in a second. <clears throat> so yes. Parameter selection. So we look at statistical uh, analysis. That's that's. Um, I'm showing you here an example of of, of phosphate collected over uh, over uh, more than a year, and and some you know that really stick, uh, easy to see uh, example. See, for example, temperature. You can see that we have uh, seasonality because obviously it changes over time. Um, but then we also have huge issues with, for example, dissolved oxygen, which is one of the one of the things that we control for because we add oxygen to the to the biological biological system to to let it do um, um, I don't know, they can do it. What do you call this? Respirate, I think in English. Um, but if you look at this uh, this plot here, you can clearly see that we have a lot of outliers and and small variances in, in this data here. And sometimes it's because it's actually the true measurement, and sometimes it's actually because there's something wrong with the sensor, and it kind of changes, and the sensors are need to be calibrated, they need to be cleaned, and so on. So we have a lot of problems with, with this data that is that we have a lot of outliers and so on. <clears throat> we, have, we also perform correlation analysis, which maybe not give us the, the full picture of the system, especially because it's, it's non-stationary. But then we look at different periods because we know that certain periods will have different influence like summer, winter, rainy, non-rainy. Um, that helps us a little bit. But of course, it doesn't give us the full picture because we don't control the input. That's a disturbance. So suddenly you can have, a, let's, let's take an example, a industry lets out some chemical that then maybe kills some of the, the biological uh, material and, and then it all falls down. And, we don't know that because we cannot predict it because it's a disturbance. So, so we do a lot, a lot of different things. And, and that's, I think, why I go back to this one is that after we, we just look at the data and perform data like, like blind, right? We just look at the data set. We come up with one possible answer and then go back just to double check because we might have just used correlation to find, you know, uh, some information from the data, but it's not necessarily equal to uh, that's actually the cause and we found the causation. So, so there's a lot of this this uh, this process here, and we are very grateful that we have good partners in, in our projects in the industry from Koya Veolia that can help us kind of uh, guide us in the right way from the expertise. And just uh, you can see down here, this is uh, one of the papers where we have uh, tried the, um, to model the system using uh, LSTM. Um, and just to give you an example, these are the parameters that we again identified. And you can already see that some very important parameters are, of course, going to be the phosphorus because this is what we're trying to control for. But we also have very important parameters, which are the flow in in, in flow, which is of course a disturbance, but but measure temperature, dissolved oxygen, and pH, and 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 um, suspended solids, which are all influencing the biology because there's some food here, there's some oxygen here, and there's some pH which influences the, the bacteria. Yes. So, do you give the raw parameters or you do something to eliminate the outliers? 
Uh, so you mean if you pre-treat the data? Right. Um, so we're very, very, gen very, very uh, cautious if we pre-treat the data. We pre-treat the data on things that are obviously wrong. Um, but we try not to to to, uh, to pre-treat the life. For example, we most of the data is not filtered because it already has been processed in some way by the SCADA system. Uh, but one of the, what, some of the things that we do is, is for example, um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, maybe I'll, I'll come a little yeah, bit yeah, later. Yeah. Yes. So <clears throat> I'll, now briefly I'll talk. Uh, let me check the time. So a little bit I'll talk about. Uh, so now we have the data set. So as you can see, also it's a huge process just to get to the data set because it's it's not something we can go ahead and download because it doesn't exist, especially not for certain measurements. And especially later on, I'll talk a little bit about nitrous oxide. It definitely doesn't exist because it's a brand new uh, measurement that we have out there. So there's a huge process in, in this, in finding the data set. <clears throat> and then in this work, in the model, we had a goal, which was essentially kind of given by, by, by some experts, but also some of it, it, we knew that we needed. So the first, Kind of the first, so the goal was to, to model phosphorus. The second one was that actually we had two milestones in this goal here that we had to achieve or at least get close to it. And, and the first one was that we wanted to predict the phosphorus and we wanted to do it without actually measuring phosphorus. So we needed a model that didn't necessarily use phosphorus measurements. And <clears throat> so it means we wanted to infer from other measurements and, 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 and why was that? Well, if it was successful, then we could avoid expensive measurements. And if even if we had the measurement, just having the measurement doesn't mean that it's, that it's going to be correct because you need to maintain it. Sometimes you get dirty, the, the sensor and so on, and, and then it, it, you, you have, um, it can drift and do many things. And the second milestone was that we needed prediction horizon for IMPC. So it had to be able to actually do a proper prediction and that was important. So essentially, we, we tested two models, model structures. One model we had. I just jump to the next one. Uh, so one of them we had the, the U, which represented those twenty-two uh, data that you saw, and one where we have UT and actually the predictions of phosphorus. So we were looking at including the phosphorus uh, measurement into the model. As I mentioned, LSTM, we use LSTM because, I mean, we could also use other things, but one of the reasons we use LSTM because they were, uh, until recently, at least for many cases, uh, state of the art. We know that there are now more state of better models for predicting time series analysis, and I'll show some results that we did use, but we actually ran into some problems with using other, the, the like uh, attention-based mechanism for, for a time series for our case. And then another challenge that also we ran into that most of you also know the problem of hyperparameters. <clears throat> so we did, we did of course, uh, we have investigated different uh, aspects. There's, you could do manual search, which is quite tedious, grid search, random search. But what we opted for was to use uh, optimization. So we use Bayesian optimization to find the parameters. And here I have included uh, the optimization range. Uh, and, and a very important one was the minute batch size. And then the result from that for the two models here. And, and then I think interesting part is that our mini batch is extremely large. And the reason for this is that <clears throat> these mini batches result uh, are equal to around four or five days of data. And that's simply because uh, and it's very logical that is that uh, that it, the optimization found that number because <clears throat> if you look at the system's dynamics, it has dynamics of like two, three, four days. So that's why it came up. So we were quite happy that we got this result and it looked like reality to a certain extent. I know that number might, for some people, might seem really large, especially in, 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 in vision, sometimes having that large, it, it's almost difficult at least no, it's not impossible sometimes to train because the model becomes the, the memory requirement becomes so large 
then results um, first showing you here um, the the model structure one so we have uh, estimation on training data which of course uh, will, will give a, a, a slightly better result but what I'm trying to show here is <clears throat> this is all the data and then we have zoomed in here and the zoom in comes from like there's from here and here and it's two uh, seemingly random places but but they actually not we have actually taken an area from february to march i don't know how the weather is here in february march but in denmark it's miserable it's cold it's rainy um and then we have taken one from from early to june i think it should be late may early june where we start where the weather starts changing as well so we have very different uh, weather events um and just if you can, it's a bit small if you cannot see, but you can see that we have not just picked uh, randomly, we have picked in the middle of uh, an area. We represent it in the state variable as phosphorus concentration. Yes. And you can see that the, the, the estimate, and this is on training data, the estimate of the, the target, it's, uh, it actually has, uh, it, it, you can see the dynamic, uh, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the the period here is actually similar to the, to the data, but the amplitude uh, is in fact. But then when we look in, in this area here, uh, in, uh, just in summer, we can actually see much better tracking. And then before I say anything more about that, I'll just jump into where we look at the test data. Uh, <clears throat> you can actually see that normally that will degrade the performance slightly, but actually we have a similar, similar example over here is that we have, um, so again, we have, so this is actually July, but you can see we have a similar area here where it doesn't perform well. And this also is, a, is kind of a proof of that it's really hard to predict these. You, you cannot just say that, okay, in July, it'll always be the same. There are many other factors than just the, the time of the year. I think I saw a hand. Yeah. How did you split the data into, uh, into train and test? Yes. Was it the first 20 days was test, uh, first 20 days was train and the last time? Yes. The, the good thing is here yeah, that um, we actually have more than a year. And so all the training, everything is done more than one year. Uh, so we can actually, we can actually have, um, we, we, we can, and what we, sorry? Season? Do you test it on the same season? Yes, exactly. Okay. So we try to, to, to take, you know, the whole year. And then when we validate it and test it, we try to do it on the same kind of season, but just not the same data because we have more years. But of course, as I mentioned, it, even if you did it, uh, you know, in uh, in January, January, it, it doesn't. It's not like proportional because uh, it's not just Denmark. Denmark is completely unpredictable weather. Forget here. You think this is unpredictable? Denmark is like it's like a lo lottery. Uh, but it's also because the the microbiology uh, changes, the the disturbance of of whatever comes from the municipality can change because we have industry and they can suddenly let out some chemicals or something that's unfavorable ph can go up and down and so on so so that's also what makes this so challenging otherwise we have just used the first order od to model everything if you could why, why wouldn't you use then weather data uh, which one why wouldn't you put as an input also weather data you have weather data. yeah we do uh that, that's something that we definitely have discussed also using weather data uh <clears throat> and actually there are some there are uh, there's a research group that that uses also radar data and, and stuff like that. Uh, as far as I remember, I think even they had their own radar to to, to look for rain. Uh, yeah, but I, we don't have it at this point yet. But again, what we what 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 one of the things that we have learned is that even if even if you have like a similar day and rain or then rain, it's not the it's not the biggest factor. The biggest factor will be unknown, like the, the microbiology. Um, but another thing that is important to, to notice here is that one of the things that changes a lot is actually we have the non-stationarity is very often in that the mean changes and the amplitude changes. But we can very, very often we see the period still being there. And that's simply because phosphorus and all of these things, one of the really strong uh, because this is closed loop data, obviously, you cannot just run a plant for a year without. Uh, the dissolved oxygen uh, is, is a very strong impact and it runs like on a cyclic uh, 
uh, a cyclic fashion. That's often what you see uh, the, being the, the period. Uh, and that's actually just the on-off control of the OCS. Yes? X is when the system goes unstable or there's... No, no, no. It's no, it's not unstable. Uh, I will, I will show a. Um, I have some extra stuff that I didn't include because I stopped talking about it because it started being more and more control, and I wanted to talk more about data and, and modeling. But I have a one or two slides of a piece of data from a operation of dissolved oxygen, and then you can see what happens. But essentially, is the way you can. Sorry? I think to the question, these are diurnal cycles, right? And the input is coming in, in a wave, right? Yeah. So, and that's forcing the reactions in the reactors. Yeah. That's why why you have these, these diurnal waves. And the ones uh, the ones you see right here, uh, they're different different spikes. But these here, is, uh, without saying something wrong, the ones you see on top is part of the dissolved oxygen part. Well, I'm saying it's on a twenty, but uh, yeah, the phosphorus though it's on a twenty four yeah. hour pretty much periodicity, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the input. Is, is fluctuating. Let me jump. Let me jump to the. Yeah. yeah. So let's just take a look. Just quickly look at the. Sorry. Are you assuming normality in the in your target feature? I mean, in your in your target variable, are you assuming it to be normal? Uh, the the input. Uh, the output. Your prediction. We have a normal distribution, or is this? I think I think you showed before in one of those box plots. Yeah, I think it was like extremely skewed. Yes, right? yes. it had like very heavy yeah. tails. If we don't assume it to be normal, yeah. and and they're very different parameters have different stochastic properties. Every day, I mean, this is very chaotic. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and and some some parts of the system are have almost like normal distributions, but some of them are time varying and have uh, okay. really skewed uh, distributions. Uh, and and the problem is again it's varying. So, so do you, do you do you like perform any transformation of the of the turret? No, 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 no. no. So if I just uh, let me just explain from from this example, which is uh, control of dissolved oxygen. Um, so this is just raw data. We haven't done anything here. This is from a plant just taken and plotted. And what I want to show here is the way it's like uh, standard practice. Uh, so. This dotted line is the important one here because that's the set point. That's the set point for oxygen and what are we of uh, oxygen, yes. And the way we control the oxygen is by uh, injecting air through a compressor and essentially be opening a valve. So valve is the this blue line. Uh, this is the flow of air. This is the, the, the set point and this is the measurement. So the way it works uh, in this example here is that the, the, the SCADA system has a, um, a, a biological model and, and you have something similar to a table lookup that looks at what are the <coughs> parameters and then it sets a set point and it's a supervisor. So it's like a cascaded yeah. control. And then you have a, a P controller here that, that controls the valve based on this one. And we have overshoot and then it simply just switches off and then again, uh, switches it on, and that's why we have these as, as well, also these very strong cyclic uh, behavior, simply because uh, it's also the, um, the control operates, I think, at a couple, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's a, for this system two or four minutes, I can't remember, and it's too slow for the dynamic of the, uh, the oxygen, and that's why we have the whole shoot. Uh, here, up here is an example of open loop measured with a very high precision oxygen, uh, dissolved oxygen measurement. And then you can see one of the big issues in this system is that when we open the, so this is valve open, this is oxygen. We have a large delay as well in, in the measurement. So that's another thing that influences a lot. We have, we have large delay and it's varying delay as well. Uh, the earliest work we have, the earliest paper we have, we actually modeled the, we tried to control oxygen, not from this large perspective, but from simply modeling the, uh, the, the airflow uh, and, uh, in, in the pipelines. And then control and, and model the diffusers and all of these things and model, model the, the, the dissolved oxygen as a first order plus dead time model. And actually, it, it was quite good model, but we quickly figured out that, okay, if we had to like essentially model every single aspect in this way, it will probably work for this one plant. And then they change something and then we have to do all over again and, and nobody will actually want to use that in the future. So that's why we turn to deep learning 
essentially the story of, of, of this entire thing is that that's why we're working on this now because we could actually include many more parameters at the same time and model the system. So that's a little motivational history. <laughs> yes? Oh, so does it work for two different plants that have two different systems? No, no, no. no. No, no, if we build a model, it will work in most cases for that plant. Because as I mentioned, every plant is different, not just the, <clears throat> not just the, the, the type of plant. So not, in Denmark, we have different types of plant. You have um, oxic and oxic where they switch. You have some where they have two different chambers. So you have one where it's oxic and oxic. And so we have different setups, the different sizes, sensors are positioned in different places. Sensor manufacturers are different. That means that the characteristics of the sensor are different. Uh, so you don't have a system you can identify. You said that you have all the parameters for one system to each extent parameters that you identify from the data. And that's what we do for one system. And then, then we work on that system and then we test it on a different system and, and actually that doesn't work. So we then we build a new model so for the new system. identify the new system. But, you know, because that's what the LFTM is doing, right? You're just feeding it data yes. and it's going to be trained on all yes. different systems. So it's very flexible. We trained only on one system. I understand, but you, the idea is that this is preferable because you can train it on the data on another oh, yes, plan. Yes, yes. Right? So how couldn't you do your system identification on another plan? Yes, we, we do that as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So these are so complementary processes, they're not combined. Right? They're not combined. This yeah. is early work where we, okay. where well, we approach this more from a con control idea, yeah. The, of course, it was we are still learning the models that are we're fitting parameters, but not as a, from a deep learning perspective. This was from a, a different step perspective. Yes, and then of course, the, the only thing I, I, the difference here is that, of course, if, if we start including the phosphorus measurement, we improve the performance of the model because essentially we know exactly what it should be. Uh, I think I'm running out of time soon. <clears throat> yes. So I'll just uh, wrap up with some of the, the so what we essentially want to achieve is we want to achieve a model that we can use as an estimator to, to, to have prediction of the, uh, of, of, in this case, it says N2O because this is our new work. We're working with N2O uh, and, and this figure I have only for N2O, but whatever you see on this side is more or less the same for all the systems. It just depends on what we are optimizing for. And this system, <clears throat> we are solely looking at M2O, but the goal is that the, 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 that the final system will optimize for, for N2O, phosphorus. Um, so the constraints will be those things, N2O, phosphorus, energy consumption, um, Yes, I think that's it. And <laughs> economy. I just understand this would be unique to every plan. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay. I mean, the, the structure will be similar from plant to plant, but the data will have to be new and train and the model will have to be retrained for every plant because what will change is you'll maybe have uh, you maybe have, let's say, um, a good example was in the beginning that. I can just say here, N2O, for example, NO2 is not measured on every plant. So they'll just disappear or come back, for example. You can see it says unmeasured input, but actually in some plants, I know of one plant where they do measure it. So you, you when you go to a new plant, you will like pluck out the th stuff that you have. Yeah, like a skeleton that you could replicate. Yes, exactly. And what we are working on as well uh, is we, we are working on, on a tool, essentially like a toolbox that, um, that helps with the data analysis. So all that data analysis I talk about, we are we're working on on a, on a small platform that, that will do that. So essentially, plug in the data, and then you in the end get some suggestions, and those suggestions will then of course have to be reevaluated with the with the operators. And mostly, mostly what, what the process that we have been doing is that we go to the engineer and the operator because the operator knows some things that the engineer doesn't because they have this feeling of of the system. Uh, that, that we, I don't know how else to explain it, but they, if you stay and look at it long enough, your brain becomes the model, right? And, and they know what they did uh, because sometimes what we'll see is that suddenly we have the data like this and then suddenly like the entire like um, uh, amplitude changes. And then we're like, what 
happen here? Why is it like this? Oh yeah, yeah, but we, we calibrated. So now, now the, the, the bound of the sensor is different. Yeah, but you didn't know because nowhere it's said what's happened. So, so there's no like, the data doesn't come with like a, like appendix of, of what has been, how it's been calibrated and all those things. And that's another thing that we are trying to also to look at. Could we, could we influence through the, the results? They adjust the range, basically. Oh, <laughs> bad idea. Of range and mean. Yeah, like calibration, true calibration. A, B, C. They have so much precision and range. They're taking the measurements every two minutes. They're really using few <laughs> sensors here. They, they wouldn't need to do it with the right. So again, we, we have to go back to what is this used for? It's not for us, it's for them. So they know what they, you know, they, if they yeah, catch they know, something, so it's good enough for them. But they didn't no, think about, we are not in the loop. So cheap for people that sell equipment for process control. <laughs> We could use better. Yeah, yeah. But this is what we're trying to, like all this work we're doing, the side effect that we hope is that we can, especially with this paper we're writing right now with this tool for system analysis is that we can also influence the industry in, 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 in kind of when they now are collecting this mod data and there's a server somewhere collecting this and so on, this infrastructure is built. Could we then go back and influence them and say, could you please do these very simple things, maybe write down what was going on then it will help us because maybe our models could actually be used cross-platform then. Yes, sorry. I'm thinking of, of chemical plant in a necessarily way, so I don't know if it translates, but I know in chemical plant it's really expensive when there's this instability because they have to flush out the whole system across a bunch of yeah, dollars. Like, can you predict the instability ahead or like think, okay, this, this sensor is about to break or, or you always assume that the data is correct? Two, uh, two models. That's why a big milestone was that we need to build a model that predicts based inferencing from other measurements because this um, oxygen is cheaper, but, but, but uh, let's say pH and some of those other measurements are much, much cheaper than, than having phosphorus measurement. Not to talk about N2O, which you know one company makes it, it's like three, four years in the market. It costs, I don't know, in dollars, but maybe two twenty thousand dollars or something like that. And after you buy it, you have to maintain it every year. And that costs another, I don't know, half of that. And then something goes wrong and you have to buy maybe a new one, you know, and, and, and that they feel that in the budget because they will have four maybe. So, so, so it's, it's a huge part of the, of the budget uh, in, in the plants. And, and I'm talking about small, not America, not Chicago, for example, where maybe that wouldn't be a big problem, but but for smaller Danish plants with maybe 50,000 uh, equivalents. So when there's a difference between the real measurement and the predicted measurement, it means that they should change the sensor? Or I'm just trying to understand what yeah, action- so only uh, for detection. We don't have full detection implemented now, but essentially our model could be a basis for full detection that, I mean, you could use I don't know, QSUM or something, you know, just to predict the faults. That, that's, that's one of options. Uh, our focus is right now on the model and now that we're doing it, we want to, to do like, why not do this as well? Our biggest thing is that we want to make MPC. And yes. Are you tracking um, hidden state variables in this? Like, like the state of the uh, um, bacteria biomass over time? So yeah, so we have SS, but, but, but bacteria, uh, not the DNA, for example, sequencing, but there is- So you are tracking the internal state of that, that biomass? Yeah. So. But what, 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 what there's another pro project that one of our collaborators in this project was what he got a grant is to, to actually do DNA sequencing online with a 10 minute interval. So not as fast as we measure other things, but 10 minutes is still great to get the bio. So you characterize the population. That's exactly, mm -hmm. because they have a characteristic of, of they already have a characteristic of um, productivity and so on. And that's one of the future things that we would like to to like get that data because then we could include that as, as a very important thing because then might we could extract the features and, and essentially so, help. Another question. Do you know anyone anyone in, in your collaboration group that's looking at um, wastewater systems for distributed surveillance of pathogens in urban settings like like COVID? Yes. Yeah, yeah they do that. They, they measure COVID in, in all sorts of problems. Distributed, in, and not just in the plant, but in the neighborhood level inside the piping networks? I have to ask. I, I'll ask. And it'd be interesting to think about sensors that are broadly activated for other pathogens, ones we don't know about yet. Yeah. 
I'll ask. Uh, Sorry, I'll, I'll go to Veolia and ask them for, for this. And if yeah, if, if anybody has some questions like like this that I cannot answer, please send me a mail and I'll I think it'll be interesting going forward if we think about you know security risks yeah. to be able to yes. have some of these broad protections. So so one one thing that, that that is interesting is that could we measure, for example, estimate the flow from other points. Uh, that that's another thing that's really interesting in this year. Are these systems some um, combined sewer overflow? Do you have stormwater coming into these, or is it just sanitary? Depends on which uh, municipality, but so most of them are system. most of them are have rainwater and drains and and, and separate uh, and separate sewer systems. Most of them are getting that at least. At least maybe some of the older cities still transition. Uh, again, we we have of course access to almost all data in Denmark, uh, so I cannot like answer on all of them, but but a lot of them have that. Um, but we still see the rain affecting just by, by falling into the tanks, right? So, so we can already see there a dilution. But yeah, you are right. That will completely change everything because you would have a massive dilution from rain. So. so if it's this the last day. No, uh, so yeah, so I just wanted to quickly talk about that. You know, we are not, uh, we are not uh, ignorant to, to that LSTM is not like the newest kid on the block. And one of the things that we're looking at as well is nitrous, nitrous oxide. I just mentioned the government likes that, so uh, so we're doing that. And I have a, a PhD, one of my PhD students is solely focusing on, on MPC control for, for including nitrous oxide and why it's, it's 300 times you know, more, more potent than CO2 as, as greenhouse gas. But one of the things we figured out is that if we thought phosphorus was difficult, this is way more difficult. Um, and, and we have some early results here that, that I'm showing you here. So we have LSDM, uh, then we have uh, two um, attention based networks, the outer form and informal, which have been converted to for estimation of time series uh, data. And, <clears throat> and it might look good, but it's also because I'm showing you the good data. It's not that good. <laughs> uh, but we are looking into this now, and we are right now in the process of, 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 of making a new style, uh, new attention mechanism that is suited for this system here. But I cannot tell you anything about it yet because we don't even have the results, even if, if I had them, I, I, even if I would want to. So. But the, so maybe motivation behind this is simply because we figured out that we had this non-stationarity issues that essentially makes it very difficult to model, not just from what you mentioned from plant to plant, but just in a single plant, things change over time. And then we figured out that there are actually some of these mechanisms here that can, that can be helpful. But I'll come back to you uh, in the future, but yes. Sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm really, really curious about this. So I'm wondering like the level of trust that plant operators have on like the model, like, do they take like, the actions like when the model indicates that something should be wrong? Do they do the necessary action to correct it, or how does that go? Like, is it like a nice dashboard for them to have, or do they actually like take decisions on the flow of the whole process yeah. uh, with? So we need another talk about this because I could talk for a long time about this because again we are doing all of these things, but we are not naive and we know that there's a problem. Whatever we do, for that to be accepted. Um, of course, some of the things are good. One one thing that is good is that many of the plants are already controlled. Uh, you know, there's a there's a plant wide control system like a SCADA system, <clears throat> and our collaborators they all are clear and they use Hubgrade. So so the operators already have everything controlled. So essentially, they can bypass it if something is wrong or to fix something. But most of the time, it just runs and they look at the data, and comes plotted in. And that's why the data is used mostly for surveillance of them. And for this, uh, this the, the hub grade system. So just on occasion, they use kind of supervisory control. Uh, so is all, 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 on, on all the time. They yeah, switch it off that, sometimes. Yeah. But the, the, this, the control is just was my question. Like you said that you control, for instance, oxygen. I, yeah. I just didn't understand what, what you actually control. Those were based on local measures. Right. Yeah. Yes. There was it's not supervisory, it's just have a sensor over there, yes. and that sensor responds locally. Then obviously the, the operators see that yes. in their HMI, but they don't tinker with that. No, no. And can they change the set yes. points? Yes. They could. 
they, 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 they could do, they can do, and they can also switch off the temporarily with the, like the supervisor because of, you know, some, some something in the process. Um, and, and your question is fantastic because of course you also have people who don't completely trust the system, not even what is there always. And, and that's, that's some of the, the, the things that, that, I mean, not me personally working on, but, but uh, we have colleagues from uh, but the anthropology people at Hyde and so on to figure out like what, how do we penetrate the to everybody so they kind of accept this. Sometimes they they will maybe it will be forced upon them as well because the way like a decision from Hyde says we are installing this, we're buying the system, but not everybody will necessarily think that that's a good idea because they are used to doing these things and they are, they they trust it and then suddenly something new comes in and the new thing that comes in is normally quite simple, but then if we suddenly come with the sample the one of the things in, we're working on in, uh, in phosphorus right now is we, we actually are, are training a, a policy to, to control this using deep functional learning. And, and, and if so I- It's only oxygen. Do you control anything else? This is to control, this is back to phosphorus. Okay. So this is controlling, this is a EU project, Marie Curie project that is called Recap, recapturing phosphorus. And our job is to improve the injection of chemical for uh, uh, this uh, iron phosphate or to, to, to settle and separate phosphorus mm -hmm. or recapturing it. So we are controlling in this one, we are controlling the, the chemical injection based on the phosphorus measurement. So that's the loop. Of course, we add other things, but that's the main loop. Kind of like the reinforcement learning agent overrides the BID controller. So it figures so out what is the right game. Simulation right now, okay. On a computer far away from anything here. Uh, and, 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 and and of course the goal is that we introduce it because this is again done, there's a company involved here at some, some point in the chain that of course wants this to work at some point. So one of the, the tasks that, that are presented for us in the research meetings is from companies like, okay, fine, please explain. And please always go back to thinking that, you know, you have to be able to be accountable for what you're doing so people will understand it. The way we envision in implementing this is uh, they use this, um, like technically they have a Docker, right? And you install your things and, and, and then it runs the system online and so on. So the idea is that we start with, with small scale, maybe small areas, we use it for maybe a few cycles and see how it performs and, and so on. We win. It's not going to be like this on switch everything off. But it would replace a PAD controller or it would? It will replace on the higher level. Yeah. So the PAD controller is, uh, might still be there for certain things like valve control or something like that, but this will be on the higher level to, to control maybe the set point uh, for the low level, maybe like, like say valve control or the, or the pump. The pump will probably still have a PAD controller, the flow of the, so we can we will control the, let's say the flow of chemical. And then that'll send to the low level control and then that controls the pump speed. Uh, Maybe some proportional controller control the pump speed related to the to the flow measurement of the of the chemical. So essentially, for us, it will be Q. Uh, I think it's it's iron phosphate. I think maybe you know better than iron phosphate. I think it's called. Uh, right here. This is essentially here. Oh, okay. This is actually. Yeah, it says. <laughs> It doesn't really explain what it is, but it's it's a metal. But I, as far as I know, it's iron phosphate that's used for this. And and essentially, what it does, I'm not a chemist. It binds with phosphorus and then sediments, and then you can remove it or something like that. Does somebody know chemistry? I don't. Know. This is something like that. So th so that's what we control. And you can see that here. It's called Q. Yes. And uh, and it was difficult to measure. Mostly because of the low number of sensors, or there are other. So until recently, there were no measurements. You can measure it in 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 in, in air, but uh, dissolved, it's that's a bigger challenge. And there's a company called the, the uh, uh, Unisense uh, located in Denmark, in in, in Aarhus, uh, which essentially it's it's a it's, Danish. Yeah, it's Danish company. Yeah. So that's why we have all the data. Okay. Basically, the, these infrastructures they. Is very poor sensing the free water. Um, I don't know what the complexity of measuring for phosphorus, but probably nobody thought about it before. <laughs> it's an easy area to be trapped if they care. They do. They do different measurements. They they do titration. They do also like uh, this uh, 
the, the electrochemical, uh, electrochemical, what they call these, I can't remember the name of some person who invented this. It's like this electrode that you put into the water and then similar to like pH and, yeah, and oxygen, yeah. it's similar. And they also oxygen is optical as well sometimes. So you have optical and this, I think it's electrochemical. No, I can't remember the name. It's, it's essentially like an electrode. Maybe some some zirconium and something like that. I mean, I'm not a chemist. I, I work with a company. It's called Skyland. They have some, yes, yes, yes. right. So they, they have, don't have a phosphorus. I mean, there would be surprised. They have phosphorus. Yes, yes they, they have phosphorus. Yeah. Yes, I, I think. I think. Uh, so the NO2 doesn't they have? No, NO2 is, is only only uh, unisense, and they they create. So essentially, unisense made it. Um, as they were originally. A spin out 20 years ago from Aarhus University, they made, uh, you, uh, they started because they lacked sensors in the chemistry lab and they started making sensors for the yeah. chemistry lab and blah, blah, blah. So, and now they make. Uh, Guys, make a NO2 sensor. Yeah, if you can make an NO2 <laughs> sensor, that works. I'll, 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 only I'll, one competitor. <laughs> if you look at their existing control systems, right? They're looking at things that are observable directly. Yes. And they're tracking and they yes. have some a priori model. Yes. And some parameters that they believe to be yes. correct. But yes. they're not observing if those parameters are drifting over time. So there's an opportunity here, and like in the vein of interpretable AI, to move towards something like a digital twin. We start saying something's going wrong with this reaction, yes. and, and and our estimate of what's going wrong is this. And you can put something in front of an operator that explains that you know membranes are being fouled or yes. whatever, but it puts a an actionable. Yeah. So essentially, this is this is is what we're doing is in, they call it a digital twin. I don't, but that's what they call it. That's what it's labeled. Like. Because you're inferring these hidden variables yeah. and, and the parameter yes. changes over time, yes. that's really valuable yeah. for them yeah. on a maintenance um, schedule yeah. and things. So what I didn't present here is that this system here, before it becomes a controller, a co using a controller, it will be used as a, as, um, a generator for, uh, for, for parameters for the operators. And that's something that we will deliver, and somebody will take over and implement it. That's the, basically, it's an advisory, advisory yes. system. Like but our, our goal is only on the, on the model, uh, and then they will implement it because from there to implementation is more like a implementation thing. Okay. You know, what are you controlling and optimizing for? It's for the, uh, in, this, in this one. Yeah. This one is phosphorus. Yeah. So, so essentially, <clears throat> you want to reduce phosphorus to zero. Uh, by injecting a chemical that binds with phosphorus and and and, and separates it out of the, of the solution, and then you want to collect that, and then essentially separate it, clean it, and and essentially you can sell phosphorus, which is a resource that is you know swindling and, and it's not you know it's not it's easy. Using fertilizers, right? Yes. And in explosives. And in explosives, <laughs> yes. but the problem with, the problem with phosphorus is as well that it's you know it, it, what we're doing. So if you take sewage. And and so so what is sewage? Essentially, it's crops, and that's made to meat. You eat meat, crops, all of those things go to the toilet, and you flush it into the ocean. Then it gets diluted into this huge ocean, and the concentration becomes zero point zero 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 something. You can never get it back again, so you lose it. That's why the government's focus is on reuse, and that's why the EU project is called Recap. We capture phosphorus because at some point we won't have any more of it. And again, our DNA is. Part of it is phosphorus, right? So you cannot build DNA, no humans, no nothing. So it's 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 a very important thing. And I, I can't remember the numbers, maybe someone maybe John, you know, but it's maybe hundred years or something, and then we'll start. And, and also phosphorus is also mined in not always best conditions, to my knowledge. So there are certain things about this problem, why it's so important. You also mentioned that N2O is even more dangerous than phosphorus. And no, no, it, it's 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 a gas that is 300 times more potent as a greenhouse gas uh, for CO2. So when we talk about the government wants reduce, it's they're not looking at CO2; they're looking at equivalents. And CO2 is, you know, if it's 300 times less, even though you have more of it. And the problem is that optimization problem is like this: is that if you want to reduce, let's say, nitrous oxide, well, <clears throat> you can do that, for example, by adding more oxygen, but then you produce, for example, more CO2 because your pumps need more energy. So it's kind of a, a trade-off. You will never go to zero, but you want to reduce it as much as possible. And then you want to reuse as many of the, of the, of the materials to produce biogas so you can create that energy in a green manner and not through fossil fuels. So you're trying to make this circular economy or, or the whole system. 
And that's why essentially the goal is to have a plant-wide controller that has optimization, uh, optimizes for, for, for all of these parameters at the same time. So it, like, for example, one of the things that we are now, uh, some of my colleagues uh, are implementing is economic MPC for this problem. Uh, and, and we are now adding on top of that, these couple of extra parameters to the MPC is being implemented. That's why I men mentioned MPC already exists. And, and our colleagues um, from DTU, they have, they have developed an economic MPC for this problem for phosphorus and it's being implemented. And then the, the PhD who did this is called Peter Stinsoff. He finished his PhD two, two years ago. He's a very close friend and then a collaborator on this one. So, so that's the goal, but we are not there yet. <laughs> So if anybody has good ideas and inputs, like you said, John, and other things, please also contact me. I mean, and and, and we also have a lot of experience and data. And, and so. so you were mentioning like you are controlling this using MPC, right? So why not put like self-learning systems, like deep learning, enforcement learning systems here? Uh, controlling the world. Yeah, so so we, we have a couple of pipelines. So in, in some pipelines, we. We, we update the, the existing MPC system and the other pipeline we are experimenting with deep reinforcement learning. It's more like how the, the, the organization is right now. Because we already have MPC systems that are operational. So we are kind of operating them. So it's more like from a, from a higher planning perspective. That looks more promising, like LSTM's attention or deep reinforcement learning in terms of its or, potential. For, yeah, so, um, I will not answer all those questions yet because that's something that we are formulating right now in the paper. And I don't have all the exact answers yet because we are not done with the full uh, study. And also we are making a, we are making a new attention mechanism that we hope can be better than what's already there because these are not of this is actually made perfectly made for this problem. It's made for NLP, by the original, and that was modified and then tested mostly on, on uh, the ETT data set and this energy data set, electricity data set from, from Chinese, which, which has different properties than biological systems, obviously, because it's kind of man made, right? But these, these are some of the analyses that we are working on right now. Uh, so I will uh, gladly share them with, uh, with some of the key people here. They can distribute them when, when we have these analyses done. Hopefully, by the end of the year. Thanks. Thank you for, for the presentation.